Yeah, so just welcome everyone. So welcome to week 25. Um, oh man, <laughs> I hope everybody's doing good. Um, it's a weird week. So, um, so yeah, um, so yeah, as is tradition, um, my name is James. I'm a husband and a father. Um, I own an automotive business. Uh, I have a degree in biblical and theological studies in ancient Near Eastern history. Uh, although I'm not an expert in anything. Um, so we started this class back in October of 2023. You should probably start saying that now. <laughs> it's been long enough. <laughs> to discuss the specific epistemological and hermeneutic framework I've developed and thought about um, over the course of my life. So we spent the first eight weeks uh, building a foundational paradigm um, so that I could say this sentence and hope that it makes sense. So the revelation of God is inherently contradictory. The biblical text describes a God defined beyond all knowledge that also wants to be known. The moment the knowledge of God transcends the boundary between what is not known to what is known, that God no longer is transcendent, but rather continuous and becomes de defined by what is known. And so this is the fundamental concern of the biblical text. Um, how uh, humanity can know God uh, without God being entirely defined by all that humanity knows. Um, this is the fun fundamental issue we are seeking an answer to. Um, another way to think of it is how God can be known as this um, without becoming known as something like this. <clears throat> so we discuss the epistemological gap between the tangible manifestations of intangible cognitions and how use and oral tradition are really the only way to bridge between the two. Um, whether it's the identity and knowledge of a Samaritan footpath um, that only can be known by its continued use, taught down uh, for generations, or a physical object like baguette and all the intangible cultural heritage of the knowledge and the actions and processes on how to make it, um, or any written text um, and how anything written is the tangible manifestation of intangible thoughts and how writing is a summary of what could have been said or could have been thought, um, how this creates a hermeneutic issue of intended meaning, um, because meaning is an intangible goal of an author, um, and that authorial meaning can be lost when words transcend into writing. Uh, one of the things I struggle with the most in teaching, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, <laughs> um, I've been using, uh, so I've been using UNESCO's preservation of tangible and intangible heritage um, as a catch-all um, example for all matters of tangible and intangible knowledge. Um, I, I think everything on UNESCO's lists um, would fit the criteria for these epistemological issues that we, you've been talking about. Um, uh, and uh, the differences between the intangible and the tangible um, heritage, uh, what transcends between them um, is the oral tradition and the use um, that gets passed down through generations. Um, and so as soon as oral tradition and use ceases to exist, um, the intangible heritage um, will cease to exist. Um, and so um, we saw these issues play out at Mount, Mount Sinai um, and how the revelation of the intangible God um, can only be about the use of its, in, of its tangible manifestation um, and why the knowledge of God revealed at Sinai are commandments um, and not something else. We discussed the tabernacle, um, or better called the dwelling place, and how the dwelling place is a physical representation of the same epistemological paradigm um, we've been discussing. Um, and we've been charting every step in the epistemology, um, how the knowledge of God um, to humanity continues to move farther and farther and farther from the ideals of Eden. Um, it continues to move far from humanity. Um, humanity's proximity to God, to the knowledge of God, continues to be less and less tangible um, as the, uh, the story unfolds. Um, and so we, we arrive at the conclusion that the only results of this epistemological issue um, is, is the idea of a prophet um, and how, um, how you know who or what a prophet is is the point um, of any and all religious texts or claims. Um, I think you could actually ask that question 
who is a prophet or what is a prophet or how do you know um, as a response to any claim made um, having to do with religion. <laughs> um, try it sometime. It's interesting. Um, so <laughs> um, I made the claim that anyone who is first across the boundary between the known and the unknown of any semantic definition of a thing um, is a prophet about the knowledge of a given thing, um, such as Wilbur and Orville Wright. Um, in the intangible knowledge of human flight uh, manifesting in the tangible form of an airplane, um, or Neil Armstrong and the 11 other astronauts who went to the moon, um, and they became prophets of the knowledge of the tangibles of the moon uh, by transcending the intangible knowledge of the moon and making it tangible through the experience of stepping foot on it. Um, or Babe Ruth uh, being a prophet of baseball by significantly expanding the knowledge of the possibilities of home run in a manner never thought possible before him, um, and thus revealed new knowledge of what baseball is or could be, um, and it changed the semantic identity of baseball forever. Um, we could continue creating examples. <laughs> um, if somebody wants to sometime, I'm happy to. So. Prophecy is the yellow line, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, a prophet is someone who makes the unknown transcend into the known. Um, and if that sounds a lot like science to you, um, also another fun thing to think about. So um, we read in Numbers 12, um, where Miriam, um, the sister of Moses, asks the question, who, who is a prophet? Is the question Miriam asks in Numbers 12. Um, and we rationalize a spectrum of the semantic definition of a prophet, um, that there are different levels or tiers to what a prophet is or can be, um, and how in the text, no prophet is more of a prophet than Moses. All prophets are compared to Moses. Um, from here, I made the following statement um, that's worth repeating, as it's probably the second biggest claim I can make in this entire class. Um, so... From, from this point on, uh, Numbers 12 on, uh, in the text, um, the entire rest of the biblical text is significantly concerned with the revelation of who and what a prophet is. Um, it does not matter where you end the biblical text, um, that the first statement is true. Um, and uh, where you end the text or where you claim revelation of God stops, um, is the foundational uh, semantic definition of your religious beliefs. Um, so for example, if I use the foot bath as a foot bath, it is then known as a foot bath. Um, but if someone comes along and says to use it as a bread pan and you use it as a bread pan, then it is now a bread pan. Uh, but the question is, is, is it then also still a foot bath? Um, the object doesn't change, but it's semantic shifts based on its use. Um, so in short, the point being, Moses invented the idea of what a prophet of an intangible God is. Um, the Torah has the right to stake that claim, and I really do believe that it does. Um, we see in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, um, we see that Hashem does not want a semantic shift to Hashem's identity. Because every time this is done, it is by definition not the identity of the intangible God. I mean, this is why it is possible to believe that you worship the correct identity of God and can thus create an idol or a false God. Um, as all an idol is, is a shift in the identity of God based on semantic use, um, as we see uh, described at Mount Sinai in Exodus 32. Um, and this is why I love the fact that the identity of the knowledge of Hashem that is revealed through Moses is the revelation of commandments. Um, I think that that is so critical um, and amazing. Um, and so we read as much of Deuteronomy as we could, um, and we saw the second generation repeat the covenant at Sinai. Um, they go to Mount Nebo. Moses goes up the mountain and gazes into the promised land, um, reveals the Torah to the second generation, and um, commissions Joshua to become the next prophet. Um, and then Moses dies. Um, and so from Mount Nebo, uh, we journeyed across the Jordan to Gilgal, um, and we see they pitched the dwelling place, um, and they keep the Passover, um, which just happened um, yesterday. Last night, Passover ended. Um, 
So they keep the Passover, uh, having accomplished finally entering the land for the first time since Genesis in the story of, uh, of Joseph. Um, they go from Gilgal and they capture Jericho. And then from Jericho, they proceed to Ai. Um, and after capturing Ai, they head north up the ridge route. And uh, we read in Joshua 8 um, that Joshua goes up to Mount Ebal. Um, and we see the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 11 and Deuteronomy 27. And Joshua places stele, uh, stones of the written Torah, on top of Mount Ebal. Um, and half of the tribes are at the bottom of Mount Ebal, and the other half are at the bottom of Mount Gerizim. Um, and in between the mountains are the priests and the Ark of the Covenant, and the blessings and the curses of the Torah are shouted at each mountain. Um, and so we map the journey from I north up the ridge route to Mount Ebal. Um, we circled Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and in between the two mountains, we see Shechem. Um, the city that has been repeatedly from the book of Genesis on the place that is the sign of the fruition of the covenant that God made to Abraham. And we see the building of an altar at Shechem to be represented by every single generation as they enter into the land. Um, and this was an important moment in our reading because this proves one of the essential beliefs that I hold, and that is that the land itself is a hermeneutic tool. If you're not from this place, or you haven't visited this place, or you're not looking at a map, you would not know that the text in Joshua is describing a scene that takes place at Shechem. And the generational repetition that begins in Genesis would be lost in your hermeneutic interpretation. And so upon arriving at Shechem in Joshua 8, we come to the first major point in the text in which the statements that I made before uh, become really obviously true. Um, because there are to this day a people group who live at Mount Gerizim and who believe Moses was the prophet of Hashem and who end their text, their authoritative biblical text, um, at the book of Deuteronomy. Um, and in other words, this people group do not believe there is any prophecy after Moses. Um, and this people group are called the Samaritans. Uh, we spent a few weeks, the past few weeks, kind of talking a lot about this. Um, but to this day, uh, the Samaritans have a functioning temple on top of Mount Gerizim, overlooking the city of Shechem, and they still use the commandments of the Torah to this day. They believe everything that we had read in Deuteronomy 27 um, and Joshua 8 happens on Mount Gerizim, um, and this was a picture that I took back in 2011 when I went to the Samaritan temple, and I had the amazing privilege of observing the Passover sacrifice something that they still do every year to this day, including Monday night. Um, the preservation and ongoing use of Samaritan culture is indistinguishable from their interpretation of the Torah, um, as would be the case of any other ethnic group today continuing to use their own cultural heritage. This is the claim the Samaritans make, and it is their quintessential identity. Um, in other words, if they stop keeping the Passover, they would no longer be Samaritan. Um, and so we we read the UNESCO submission from 2012 when Samaritan culture and the sites on, on Mount Gerizim were proposed to UNESCO to become a World Heritage Site. I um, mean, we read in the listed submission that it is not the fact that Samaritans are on top of a mountain that makes their heritage unique, but rather it is their continued use ongoing for generations um, that has no real comparison. Um, so the uniqueness of the Samaritans is that the is that the preservation of oral tradition via ritual use is built into what they are preserving in their use. Um, in essence, making them the preservers of the preservation of oral tradition of oral tradition. Um, if it's not about anything else, it's at least about that. Um, which to me is what historicism and academia is fundamentally seeking um, in all knowledge. Um, and so I propose two questions um, that I think the existence of the Samaritans requires everyone else to have to think about. Um, the first point to ponder is this. If you are an atheist or find no value in religious thought, do people have a right to define their cultural heritage and its value to their self-identity in existence? Um, and that's a mouthful, and there's a lot of implications from a sentence like that and things that could be discussed or thought about. Um, 
The second point um, that I believe the Samaritan, the the uh, this, the ongoing use of Samaritan um, identity uh, creates is that if you claim any theological beliefs stemming from Abrahamic tradition, um, you you must rationalize why the Samaritan should believe in any prophecy or revelation after the Torah. Um, and uh, I believe this is the greatest problem pertaining to any and all Abrahamic faith traditions. Um, I think this is the greatest problem that I can rationalize. Um, if you believe Jerusalem or the Vatican um, or Mecca are the places where Hashem um, or the name, uh, if you believe those places are the places the name placed its name, um, you have to rationalize how you know if a prophet that came after Shechem is a prophet of Hashem. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, it might not be adequately possible to do. <laughs> um, and so upon arriving at this point, we ran into our first major issue because the Samaritan Torah is slightly different uh, than the Torah that most Jews and Christians use and are aware of. I mean, one of the biggest differences in the tradition that the place Hashem will place the name is on Mount Gerizim, a claim first made in the Ten Commandments um, for the Samaritans. Um, which we read um, from the Samaritan Torah. Okay, so then last week we had a bit of a thought exercise um, using the foot bath as an example of how the use of epistemology, science, and historicism can be helpful or can be very unhelpful. Um, and I would love to explore these ideas more. <laughs> um, if it's confusing, go back and watch last week, um, and you know, I'd be happy to talk about these things more. Um, but um, we did this because I wanted to make it clear um, that I'm not saying the ongoing use of anything pertaining to Samaritan culture today means that as it is today, so it was exactly in the past. Um, I'm not saying the Samaritans are dogmatic about their their beliefs. Um, rather, what I'm trying to say is that the use of anything within Samaritan culture today can be reflective of similar use in the past and can and probably should have a healthy level of skepticism of how for certain it can be known to be reflective of something in the past. And this is why I say historicism is not actually the goal. The archaeological field isn't saying the footpath is a footpath because it is known for 100% certainty that it has always been used as a footpath. Rather, the scientific community is saying that it is a footpath because all of the evidence suggests that it has been used as a footpath between the only two points of data found. Um, and we actually need to identify it. We have to identify the footpath as something so that we can have language about it talk about it, learn from it, explore it. Um, identity, even if it's false, gives function to cognition. Um, and I know that can be hard um, to understand. So I'm going to give an example, um, and I hope that this helps. So let's try this out. Um, and so this is a picture of an archaeological object. So we're going to play a game. And I'm going to list some of the attributes that are known about this object. And I want you all to tell me what you think the object is based on what is scientifically known about it. OK? OK, so let, let's play. So first off, this object was found in the Negev desert. So with that information, does anyone know what this is? No. Two, so this object was found in a grave. In a grave. So does that help anyone know what it is? <laughs> Say what? You'd guess something, it's something? <laughs> Let's hear it. A tool used for cutting or stabbing food. Okay. Kind of great. Um, I don't know. 
wonder what <clears throat> about what other relics may have been archaeological in that archaeological dig because yeah, it could be. mainly my understanding is the reason why something is is placed in someone's what would you call it grave tomb whatever you want to call it is for maybe access into the next life okay something that would be usable into the next life so for instance food is usually put in there a lot of different kinds of food honey and what have you and, down. and this may be as robert said a tool but it may be a sword it depends upon you know maybe it was was like you know royalty or pauper or what kind of grave site was it all valid points right um you're in the line of thinking of an archaeologist right that's that's what that's what you want right <laughs> um okay so um so this object is dated to 4000 bce so does that help anyone know what it is <laughs> no so this object it's 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 10.2 inches long does that does that help no okay <laughs> so this object is made of wood all right so no not gonna tell it's just a walking stick of dead people that from the desert that ended up dead. <laughs> Um, it's the same thing one is it's a picture the yeah one is um i think it's the same thing it's just different views Ten point two inches oh that's it yeah never mind okay so the the sick thing is uh this uh, the the object is also made of lead Okay. Does it have a hole in it? That's that's what it is. A club. Okay, so the next next thing is uh so the isotope analysis of the lead shows that it was smelted in the Taurus mountain range of Anatolia, which is today Turkey. So the lead came from Turkey, but this was found in the desert in the Negev in, uh, you know, in Sinai, right? So a torch. Okay, so some good guesses. Anybody confident in an answer? Yeah. So that's it. That's that's literally all there is to know about this object. <laughs> so anyone know what it is? So guess, guess what? Whatever you think it is, you would be correct because nobody knows what this is. So unless someone finds someone using this object today, nobody's ever gonna know what it is. It's 6,000 years old. So there's theories, there's things that kind of look similar that you can read the archeologists talk about, like, well, maybe it's this or this, but everything comparable to it is very different, not of the same era. There's just so many issues with making a claim of this is what this is. So this is an archeological object that is very different than the foot bath. You have a reasonable scientific idea of what the foot bath is because of its continued use. That's not true with something like this. That's lead. The knob up top is lead. It's like, it's only that big. So one of the things, uh, and, and when I was working on this, I was like, oh my God, there's so many places I wanted to go with this philosophically. Um, because I think there's a philosophical argument to be made that if I could go to the museum this is in and steal it, I would argue however I decide to use it is, is what it is. <laughs> um, and that's one of the issues I'm trying to argue uh, in this is you can do whatever you want and make something what it is that that's not what it is, right? And the question is, is then is it still what it is?
right? Uh, but again, it's very philosophical. Science doesn't like those trains of thought. Um, <laughs> okay, so bottom line, though, nobody knows what this is, and nobody can know what this is. So, so here's the problem: is um, can you imagine the issues that would exist if this was the object that I've been using to teach instead of the foot bath? Because what word do I use to describe this? You know, maybe every sentence I say where I say foot bath, I would be using this instead and have to say the undefinable, unknowable object. And what I'm trying to kind of get at is the words that you use to describe this thing's identity is the same issue that we run into when the text is describing the identity of God. <laughs> um, so can you imagine? Uh, uh, yeah. So so how would I effectively communicate everything that we've discussed over the past ten weeks if I was using an object that doesn't have words to call it? If you'd have to describe it every time you talked about it, uh, this class would be five times longer. Um, and so one of the things that everybody does is we take words and we make them shorter. Um, for the cognition of communication, because it's it's just what you have to do. You, you literally have to do that every day. Um, so you wouldn't believe the hermeneutic issues that I could create if I taught this class using an unidentifiable object. Um, but it would almost be fun to try, um, but I'm not going to. Um, and I, I generally mean it when I say, if I were to try to do that, I, I would sound crazy. The words coming out of my mouth would sound crazy. Because um, I could call this whatever I want. <laughs> and this is why the interpretation of the identity of an object is a hermeneutic issue, because this issue, as it pertains to the identification of a Samaritan footpath, is from the perspective of an outsider looking in. But the point being is, from the perspective of the Samaritans, they don't have to take this approach, because it's their use. Just like I could go pick this thing up and use it however I want, and say that that's what it is because that's how I'm using it. <laughs> um, so let's see, I just lost my slide. Okay, so rather from the perspective of, so, so scientifically this is, the, this is the approach an outsider can take, but from the perspective of a Samaritan, the function or the point is, is this. This is the point of ritual use in oral tradition. And again, we all actually do this every day with ourselves, but I just, we, we don't think about it uh, because we don't think about ritual. Um, in fact, I'll say it now. One of the reasons I start every single class the same way is because I'm trying to establish a ritual. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, in the coming weeks. But um, the use of a foot bath could have changed, but it's changed that's irrelevant to the preservation of their oral tradition throughout time. However they use it is how it is for them because it is a part of who they are. And this to me seems easy enough to understand when discussing a foot bath, but this issue becomes very complicated and very difficult when we're discussing the use of something like the Torah, for example, um, much less the identity of an intangible God like Hashem. So what I'm trying to say is the use of oral tradition as the transmission of tangible ongoing use as the means of identification of intangible identity, that is what gets preserved through ritual use. The use can change and it will cause a, cause a semantic shift in the identity of an object and this creates an epistemological problem for any point of view outside of ritual use. You won't find Samaritans talking about anything I'm talking about. They don't need to talk about it. They just do. So I'll give you an example. I actually created a historical hermeneutic issue in discussing this very thing last week. Um, so there's information on this chart that is wrong. <laughs> Um, and last week when I went through this, I said the wrong thing over and over and over and over again. And and that's this. I said the footpath that was found at Lakish, that's what this picture is, the footpath from Lakish, 
that it was dated to 1800 BCE. And maybe someone in this class um, watching now or on YouTube or one of my old professors someday watches this and they're thinking, that's not right. There's no way that object was found dated to 1800 BCE. I mean, if you caught that error last week, maybe you said, huh, the fact that this guy is stating an incorrect scientific historical fact means he doesn't know what he is talking about. And I'm going to stop listening now. And you would be correct, because every time I said the foot bath was from 1800 BCE, I was stating something that is scientifically incorrect. Because the foot bath is actually dated to 800 BCE, not 1800 BCE. And if you have a very scientific mind, if you only focused on that point of what I said last week, if you only focus on the incorrect historical fact of what I said, you missed the entire point of what I was saying. <laughs> My counter would be, it doesn't matter what the date of the footpath is from. It doesn't matter if it's from 1800, 800, 200, 380, 1930s, today. Doesn't matter. That has no effect at all on the statements that I've made. My intended goal and what I was saying with my words was not a lesson in the history of the footpath. I did that the first class that I brought up the footpath. That was a history lesson. In fact, the books, the academic journals about this footpath are right here. I got them. <laughs> These are them from 1932. Those are first editions. <laughs> Those books are 100 year, almost 100 years old now. Um, that would be a history lesson, but that wasn't the function of what I was saying. My goal was rather a lesson in why historicism in science is a tool of epistemology, but it is not the correct framework for understanding the evolutionary function and use of oral tradition and ritual. So even with my own words, if you made historicism the hermeneutic goal of my words last week, you would have the wrong interpretation of what I said. So this is why I say, if a claim isn't historical, then historicity is not the intended use, and you'll end up using a hermeneutic that will conclude a bad interpretation that will fall very short of intended meaning. <clears throat> okay, so from there, we did a short comparison between uh, Jewish and Samaritan identity. Um, so from the perspectives of, and we, we did this contrasting from the perspective of Samaritans. Um, so now I would love to go on a journey together, diving deep into Samaritanism, uh, but we don't have time. Um, however, for those of you who want to learn more and research more on these matters, I have brought some of the books available in English about the scholarship of the Samaritans. So I've got a stack of book here, books here. You walk on read, look through them. Just be careful with them because a lot of them are rare, uh, rare collectible books. They're not easily found. Um, so one of them, this one's easy to get. Um, one of them is this. This is the Samaritan Torah translated into English. Um, it also has the, the what's called the Masoretic text, which is the text that all those Bibles back there are based on. Um, so this is an English translation, the Samaritan Torah that also has the Masoretic text side by side. So every line in the text um, anything in bold is a difference between the two texts. Um, the Masoretic text is what most Christians and Jewish texts are based on. Um, so this text is from a Samaritan perspective, translated by a Samaritan. And so this, this is a book um, about Samaritan culture and ritual use. Um, also written by a Samaritan from a Samaritan perspective for non-Samaritans. <clears throat> um, and then this gets into some of Samaritan oral tradition and interpretation. Um, and it, it's this is cool because it's written by two Samaritan high priests um, and translated into English. Um, and again, this would be from Samaritan perspective. And then this book, uh, this is awesome. Um, I was ecstatic when I learned about this. Um, this book was published for an exhibition um, that was done for the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. 
Um, and so this book is really cool. It has amazing pictures in it that, that show Samaritan culture and tradition um, and the expressions of Samaritan identity. Um, this book is not from the perspective of Samaritans. Um, it rather takes an objective anthropological approach um, as one would expect from a museum. Um, so I strongly encourage anyone to take a look through that book. Um, it's really cool. So, um, and then this one, um, this book um, is much more of an objective um, scientific academic approach about the historicity of the Samaritan Torah. Um, this is critical. This is critical scholarship. Um, this is a critical book. Um, it is not from the perspective of the Samaritans. Um, so I think these authors, I, I think the authors of this are Christian, um, but they're they're certainly biblical scholars. Um, so this is fascinating, um, really interesting to to read through. Um, and that is in English. All these books are in English, which is why I, I brought them up. So um, yeah, okay. And so we could go really in depth on these matters. And what I'm trying to say is, I don't need to, if you're interested, all that information is out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's certainly worth starting and digging in to, into. Um, we just we just don't have time. Um, and so I, I don't mean to um, ignore the Samaritans because I love them. Um, and uh, I, I think there are like, such an ideal um, expression of belief. Um, but we're going to keep keep moving on. Um, and so uh, we're going to leave the Samaritans at Mount Gerizim. Um, and we want to progress onwards um, and to hope to answer one of our key questions, which is when and why did Jerusalem become the holy city? that you've heard of, and not Shechem. I mean, so we, we had read and mapped, um, we read and mapped up to Joshua chapter 8, and so now I would love to continue going through the entire book of Joshua and mapping as we go. I would, I would love to, um, but we got to skip forward. Um, Joshua 9 brings the stories of the rest of Joshua's leadership in the conquest of Canaan. So you could, if you want, I strongly recommend, you could read through the rest of Joshua, starting in Joshua 9, and you could find the place names on your map, and you could trace the boundaries of the territories of the tribes, because that's what the book is about, is the tribes um, capturing their, um, their inherited land, as described in the text. Um, so right now, we're going to skip forward to Joshua 18, um, and we'll read so then the whole congregation of the Israelites assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting, uh, the dwelling place there. The land laid subdued before them. There remained among the Israelites seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you slack about going in and taking possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you? Provide three men from each tribe, and I will send them out that they may begin to go throughout the land, writing a description of it with a view to their inheritances. Then come back to me. They shall divide it into seven portions, Judah continuing in its territory to the south, and the house of Joseph in their territory on the north. You shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the descriptions here to me, and I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. So the men started on their way, and Joshua charged those who went uh, to write the description of the land, saying, Go throughout the land and write a description of it and come back to me, and I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and traversed the land and set, back, uh, set down in a book a description of it by towns and seven divisions. Then they came back to Joshua in the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua portioned the land to the Israelites to each a portion. Uh, yeah. What, what about it? 
they're just not factored in. How can these people say, I'm going to go out there and survey and then come back and I'll divide it between you? I mean, yep. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you're not going to find an answer to that in the text. <laughs> Um, but I will also then say you're not going to find a moment in time in human history in which humans have not done that. Um, so I, it's not that I don't. It's like I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> Where would that history be? Not what? That history, like what he's asking about. Where is that? Of those people? Yeah. Of the people before. Your answer has been my answer to him for many different situations. So he's looking <laughs> Of the people before, I mean, the people like he's saying that were there already. I suppose somewhere. It's there, it's be. tough. That's that right. That's an issue of oral history and continued use. I should be on the question. <laughs> okay, we're gonna table that. I'm not touching that with a 30 foot pole. Um, OK, so if you guys want, you, know, you can you can take out your your map number three. Um, and um, I guess we only need. A green and yellow. <laughs> what do you forget about? To pass out the markers. Well, is that sort of there? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Unless you want to do down here, right here. Yeah. 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 Make a big circle around you. It's very yeah. It's very small. You got not people here and not here yeah. here. Yeah, I want to tell you, Mr. Warner. I know they're so small. Oh, okay. God. Um, I'm going to point it out to you. I'm keeping your finger there. Right here, Chicago. Right there, Chicago. Might as well highlight that and circle it. <laughs> okay. OK, so got our maps out. So we're, we're at Shikam um, after Joshua 8. And then we skipped to Joshua 18, um, and we, we skipped a bunch of stuff in the text between Joshua's 8 and chapters or 18. Skipped a bunch that we could map, but we're not, because um, we don't have time. <laughs> and so now in Joshua 18, um, the dwelling place, the tabernacle, is pitched. It's set up at Sh Shiloh. And so if we look at our map, and so if you go south down the ridge route, and about halfway between Shechem and I, to the right off the road, you will see Shiloh. So we'll highlight and circle Shiloh like this. Red. Thank you. Um, that's where you put the turn of the day line right there. Yeah, that's AI. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're good. So you can circle Shiloh, um, make a circle, a circle around Shiloh. Um, Okay. Okay, so yeah, and, and you here, can you get on here? Right here, AI right there. Circle AI in green, and then that road that connects in this road here. Do you go from AI up? Past Shiloh up to Shikam. That's the red route. And then what in, in green. So you can see it. Okay. 
Um, and so we highlighted circled Shiloh and then you can just make a little green line to connect Shiloh to the ridge route. It's slightly off the uh, the beaten path, um, which is part of the point, but. Um, and then you can take a, a red marker and make a little box somewhere around Shiloh. And uh, we'll, we will we basically remember that the red box is a representation of places where the tabernacle um, was um, was placed. And I want to point out, remember, the Samaritans don't believe any of this. <laughs> they don't leave Shechem. <laughs> They have a temple. Yeah, temple. Yeah. Right. It was a, it was a moving temple. So they had they built a temple. The Samaritans built the temple. These guys right. left. They took it, and they said, "Well, let's build our own." Maybe. Correct. So that stuff gets yeah. complicated and interesting. But just remember what we're doing right now. The Samaritans do not. They don't they don't hold any of this tradition as authoritative. Um, and so. Um, so the question is, is what rationality does the text give to leave Shechem and go to Shiloh? So why is the tabernacle placed at Shiloh in the book of Joshua? And the problem is, is we don't see anything in Joshua. There's no statement of Hashem saying to Joshua something like, Remember when he went to Shechem just now and built the altar and you spoke the Torah and renewed the covenant? Remember when you did that? Never mind. I want you to go to Shiloh instead and do the same thing. We don't see that in the text. And uh, it's interesting because we come to Joshua 22 and we do read this. Um, so then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and he and said to them, You have observed all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed me and all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your kindred these many days down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your kindred as he promised them. Therefore, turn, go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan, take good care to observe the commandment and instruction that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to keep his commandments, and to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half, Joshua had given a possession beside their fellow Israelites in the land west of the Jordan. We could map all this and it would make all this a lot clearer, but we don't have time. Um, uh, and when Joshua sent them away to their tents and blessed them, he said to them, go back to your tents with much wealth and with very much livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and with a great quantity of clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your kindred. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they go across the Jordan, right? They return home, parting from the Israelites at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Um, they leave to go to the land of Gilead, their own land from which of which they had taken possession by commanding uh, command of the Lord through Moses. And when they came to the region near the Jordan that lies lies in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of great size. The Israelites heard that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh had built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region near the Jordan, on the side that belongs to the Israelites. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Then the Israelites sent the priest Phinehas, son of Eleazar, to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And with him, ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them the head of a family among the clans of Israel. 
They came to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, and they said to them, Thus says the whole congregation to the Lord, What is this treachery that you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away today from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar today in rebelling against the Lord? Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves and for which a plague came upon the congregation of the Lord, that you must turn away today from following the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel tomorrow. <laughs> but now if your land is unclean, cross over it in the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle, the dwelling place now stands, Shiloh, and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or rebel against us by building yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Akan, son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of the devoted things, and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel, and he did not perish alone for his iniquity? Then the Rubites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, The Lord, God of gods, Hashem, he knows, and let Israel itself know, if it was a rebellion or in breach of faith toward the Lord, do not spare us today. For building an altar to turn away from following the Lord, or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or offerings of well-being on it, may the Lord, may Hashem himself take vengeance. No, we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with Hashem, the God of Israel? So, for Hashem has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. You Reubenites and Gadites, you have no portion in Hashem. So your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you and between the generations after us that we do not that we do perform the services of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and offerings of well-being. So that your children may never say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. And we thought if this should be said to us or to our descendants in time to come, we could say, look at this copy of the altar of the Lord, which our ancestors made not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away from this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offerings, and sacrifice, other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his dwelling place. When the priests, Phineas, and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Manassites spoke, they were satisfied. The priest, Phineas, son of Eliezer, said to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Manassites, Today we know that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have saved the Israelites in the hand of the Lord. Then the priest Phineas, son of Eliezer, and the chiefs returned from the Reubenites and the Gadites in the land of Gilead to the land. Um, to the land of Canaan, thank you, to the Israelites and brought back word to them. The report pleased the Israelites, and the Israelites blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the Reubenites and the Gadites were settled. The Reubenites and the Gadites called the altar witness. For said they, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Okay, so from Shiloh, don't, don't do anything on your maps other than look at it, but from Shiloh, three of the tribes are to return to their lands in Gilead, which is east of the Jordan. This was promised back in Numbers chapter 32, which we did not read, um, but we should have. <laughs> But we didn't. Um, and uh, these tr three tribes, they leave Shiloh and on their way back east of the Jordan to Gilead. On their way, upon arriving near the Jordan, on the side of the Jordan of the Israelites. So somewhere on, somewhere over here. Don't know where, it doesn't say. Um, somewhere over there, they build an altar. And so we're not going to trace this because it's too vague. But 
the existence of this passage tells us a few things. So one, upon learning that the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh built an altar in a different place than Shiloh, the Israelites freak out and they prepare to go to war against them because it reminded them of the sin of Peor. Now, we did not read enough in Numbers to cover this story, but the sin of Peor is from Numbers 25 and takes place at Shittim, which is also on our maps. Um, we might revisit that. I don't know. Uh, I recommend reading Numbers 25 or the entire book of Numbers for that matter on your own. Um, and if you want, again, geographically, um, it's, it's another repetition in, in the text. Uh, but the three tribes say, no, this altar is not like that. We didn't build this altar to sacrifice. Rather, we built this altar to remember, to teach our children and your children that we are a part of you. So in essence, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh set up an altar. They set up stelae, standing stones, something. They make something in order to remember, which again, this should remind you of all the other instances in the text. We've read where this exact thing happens. And it's interesting because verse 12 says, and when the people of Israel heard it, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. So the people in the tabernacle and the priests are at Shiloh. And their concern is that the three tribes going across the Jordan are building a competing altar. That's what this whole passage is about. And they're so concerned about it, they prepare to go to war against three of the tribes. So the question is, what the heck happened between Shechem and Shiloh? <laughs> the book of Joshua gives no explanation or answer as to how or why the center of worship moves from Mount Gerizim to Shiloh. And it's particularly interesting because it does it does have an entire section dedicated to the idea of the consequences of one of the tribes creating an alternate place of worship and sacrifice that isn't at Shiloh. Why isn't there a similar text about Shechem to Shiloh? <laughs> I find the lack of explanation of the text of why Shiloh to be very interesting and realistically very problematic. So if you don't believe me, I'm serious. Read all of the book of Joshua. There is no explanation as to why they build the dwelling place at Shiloh. It's not in the text. So in fact, if we keep reading past Joshua 22, uh, we come to this. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies all around, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, their elders and heads, their judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. You've seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For the Lord your God who has fought for you, I have allotted to you an inheritance for your tribe, those nations that remain, along with all the nations that have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea of the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess the land as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very steadfast to observe and do all that is written in the book of the Torah, turning aside from neither to the right nor the left, so that you may not be mixed with these nations left here among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow yourselves down to them. But hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, and as for you, no one has been able to withstand you to this day. One of you puts a flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God, for if you turn back and join the survivors of these nations left here among you, and intermarry with them so that you may you marry their women, and they say, um, and, and they and they yours know assuredly that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you a scourge to your sides, um, a thorn in your eye, until you perish from this good land that the Lord your God has given you. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one thing has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. 
all have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the bad things until he has destroyed you from this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he enjoined on you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land that he has given to you. <sighs> okay, so Joshua is about to die. And Joshua summons the people. Question, where does he summon them to? It doesn't say, does it? Maybe Shiloh? Hmm. So he summons the people to somewhere, and we see very similar language to when Moses was about to die in Deuteronomy. We see the same types of language. You've seen what Hashem has done for you in the land of your inheritance. Now observe the Torah and don't turn to the right or the left so that you may not be mixed with other nations surrounding you and serve their deities. Again, if you don't keep the Passover, you won't keep the Passover. So we keep reading. Joshua 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah, I love that it mentions Terah, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst, and afterwards I brought you out. When, you, when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over to the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land in which you had not labored." in towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive, year, olive yards that you did not plant. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors, Terah, served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as far as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. And he said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to obey the Lord, the God of Israel. 
the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, for him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the Torah, and he took large stones, stele, and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said to the people, see, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you if you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away to their inheritances. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. They buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Sirah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua have known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. The bones of Joseph, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the portion of ground that Jacob had bought from the children of Hamar, the father of Shechem, this is back in Genesis, for 100 pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. Eliezer, son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of his son Phinehas, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. And so the book of Joshua ends with the death of Joshua. And notice they're at Shechem, not Shiloh. And notice how similar the death of Joshua is at Shechem to the death of Moses in Deuteronomy at, at Mount Nebo. And we see before Joshua dies, he repeats the covenant at Shechem again. So as with Moses, we see the recitation of the Torah at Mount Sinai in the first generation. We read that in Exodus. And then 40 years later, there's another recitation of the Torah at Mount Nebo from Moses to the second generation out of Egypt. And at that point, Moses dies. Then they cross, they cross the Jordan. And we see a recitation of the Torah at Shechem with Joshua in the first generation in the land after Egypt. And now at the end of Joshua, we see a recitation of the Torah at Shechem with Joshua in the second generation in the land. And then Joshua dies. And again, now we're left with the end. So, so where did Shiloh come from? And also, who is supposed to replace Joshua? Deuteronomy spends a bunch of time on the succession of Moses to Joshua. And there's nothing. There's nothing. There's no successor. Who is the next prophet after Joshua? And so this brings us to the next book, the book of Judges, which, again, I'm just like, read this stuff because uh, it's incredible. Um, God, I want to read this, but I also don't. <laughs> um, let's see if I can. So I'm just going to read a couple of sections of this. I'm just going to skip here. Read the whole thing sometime for once. So this is the first, this is Judges chapter one. So after the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired of the Lord. That's to fight against them. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. I hereby give the land into his hand. Judah said to his brother Simeon, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. Then I too will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Um, yada, 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 they go, they do their thing. This is when they leave Shechem. So Joshua dies, they're leaving Shechem. Um, and um, so then it just talks about some of the places, you know, Judah, verse 18, Judah took Gaza with its territory, Ashkelon with its territory, Echon with its territory. So Judah goes and conquers the territory that becomes the land of Judah. Um, says, the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country. But could, here's the gear. Here we go. Ready? This is your answer, Robert. But Judah could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak, 
But the Benjamites did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites had lived in Jerusalem among Benjamites to this day. So again, I would love to just read through the book of Judges with you and map these stories as we go, but we don't have time. But notice, the first chapter of Judges is a story about the tribe of Judah conquering the lands of its inheritance. So now a couple of thoughts on this passage. One, notice the hermeneutic issue in Judges 1. It says, Judah says to his brother Simeon, who is Judah? Because it's not Judah as in Judah, the son of Jacob, as this would be like a hunt, like hundreds of years later. <laughs> Judah is long dead. And so this is a passage where the text implies that Judah is the tribe of Judah, but textually it just uses the name Judah as if Judah himself is the person saying these things, which I love because, again, each generation is supposed to be the continuation of the prior the Semitic thought is that your identity is your father's identity and his father's identity and his father's identity. And yada. so what the tribe of Judah does is as if Judah is doing it. <clears throat> or you have to interpret this literally saying this is Judah, which is problematic and nonsense. So my question is, is here's an example where contextually you interpret the name to be something different than what the text itself says. Because you know, epistemologically, Judah is dead. So it isn't referring to Judah, but rather the current manifestation of Judah through the tribe of Judah. So I wonder what other areas of the text do the same thing. As I've said, I think geographically the same idea applies. When the text mentions places, place names like Shechem repeatedly through generations, these things are generational repetitions which makes sense because that is how oral tradition functions in its use across generations. Two, notice we came upon a city in this passage. I mentioned Jerusalem. So we actually skipped over the first time Jerusalem is mentioned in the text. The first mention of Jerusalem is in Joshua chapter 10. And I would argue Jerusalem is not important even in the book of Joshua. It is a fortified city to be conquered, and that is it. But that's a different discussion for a different time. But the point being, we do start to see Jerusalem starting to be mentioned as we get through the books of Joshua, Judges, and so forth. But notice here in Judges chapter 2, the use of Jerusalem is for the purposes of mentioning that the Benjamites did not drive the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. So notice Jerusalem is in the lands of the tribe of Benjamin, not Judah. Jerusalem is not in the lands of Judah. And also notice that Benjamin does not successfully conquer Jerusalem. And in essence, this is what Judges chapter 1 is about. Judah conquers its territory and the other tribes don't. And we read Judges 1, 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bashan and its villages. Going to keep going. Uh, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalalal. <laughs> Ashur did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Again, Robert, answering your question. The Amorites pressed the Danites back into the hill country. They did not allow them to come down to the plain. The board of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim to Selah and upward. So let's continue to Judges chapter 2. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. This is the only time Bochim is mentioned in the text. The theory is that it's Bethel. But nobody knows. Um, Angel of the Lord goes from Gogol to Bochim and says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I had promised your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. For your part, do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my command. See what you have done. 
So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become adversaries to you, and their God shall be as a snare to you. And the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the Israelites, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named that place Bochim, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. But when Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites all went to their own inheritances to take possession of the land. The people worshipped the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. So they buried him within the bounds of his inheritance. Yada, yada. Here we go. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worshipped the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods from among the gods that the people who were all around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned Hashem and worshipped Baal and Ashtoreth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the power of their enemies all around, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them to bring misfortune, as the Lord had warned them and sworn to them, and they were in great distress. So Robert, the answer to your question is... It didn't happen. So Joshua dies, and there was no succession with a prophet. There's no prophet after Joshua. And so what happens? What happens without a prophet? Exactly what you would expect to happen. It's the entire point of this entire class. Without a prophet from Hashem like Moses or Joshua, the next generation does exactly the thing the text says would happen. They will mistake Hashem for Baal. They will create a semantic shift in the identity of the intangible deity by making a tangible deity. And I love this because I find it hilarious. Because I believe critical scholarship of biblical text, I, I believe the scholarship agrees with this, and it's in the scientific evidence. All of the debates surrounding the existence of the Israelites, the conquest of Joshua, or uh, yeah, the, yeah, the conquest with um, with Joshua, and the use of the identity of Hashem through the Tanakh supports this idea that the people cannot distinguish between Hashem and Baal. <clears throat> so, for those of you on TikTok. One of the coolest people on social media today um, is an awesome scholar I really like named Dan McClellan. And I absolutely recommend watching his content. Um, he posts great content. I don't agree with everything that he says. Um, I, he's very historically focused and I, I, he does not acknowledge oral tradition a lot. And I think that that creates some issues with, with use. Um, but he does have very valuable insights as far as biblical historicism. Um, so he hosts a great podcast um, for biblical scholarship called Data Over Dogma. Um, I really recommend it. I love it. I listen to it all the time. And so this is his book, um, which I'm, I'm very proud to have a copy of. Um, I got a signed copy from him. Um, yeah. So... Uh, this is his book, and it speaks, it's it's literally about this exact issue. Um, he's trying to take a scientific approach to human cognition um, as to why in the text um, Baal and El are the same God, um, and there's like no apparent contradiction with that. Um, it's it's very interesting. Um, the book is really complicated. It's a, it's a, it's it's hard. I've read it like three times and I'm still trying to understand all of it. Um, <laughs> but the point being is the scholarship literally is Baal and El, Elohim, um, Hashem, are they same God in Canaanite mythology? Um, and that's very interesting because to me, I go, yeah, it's what the text says. It's literally what happens. It's exactly what you would expect to see scientifically. Um, I think the point of the Torah is trying to argue, don't do that. Um, and it's so funny to me because from a point of scholarship, we can't see a difference scientifically, um, which is why I think the name Hashem is so important. I just don't think there's anything like the concept of the name. 
it's so different. Um, if God is intangible, not definable by anything within human knowledge, then humans will create a semantic shift to the quintessential attributes and identity of that God in every attempt of identifying that God. So this is why I start every class with this sentence. This is the point. I'm just trying to argue that the use of the biblical text in religious tradition over time is an issue of prophecy. That of course, as soon as we arrive at the point in the text where Moses and Joshua are gone, the people will shift to the semantic identity of Hashem. So what is the solution? I thought the whole point of all of this was Mount Sinai was the solution. So why isn't there a successor to Joshua? And if you're a Samaritan, you say, because there's not a successor to Joshua. And that's what's so interesting is Samaritans don't have an issue with any of this. This is not a problem they have to rectify. This is not something they have to rationalize. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. From a theological... Yes. Yelp. As I've spent 15 years thinking about this issue, and it's very like, hmm. Okay, so now continuing to Judges 2. Here we go. So here's our current solution. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the power of those who plundered them. Yet they, yet they, the people, did not listen even to their judges, for they lusted after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their ancestors had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord. They did not follow their example. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord would be moved to pity by their groaning because of those who persecuted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they would relapse and behave worse than their ancestors, following other gods, worshiping them and bowing down to them. They would not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their ancestors and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel, whether or not they would take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their ancestors did. The Lord had left those nations, not driving them out at once. I did not hand them over to Joshua. Yes. So at this time, this is referring to all of those people that didn't conquer their lands. Mm -hmm. And this is in the area. It's not in Shechem. It's not in Shia. Yeah, it's, it's, all over it's the lands that the tribes are supposed to conquer. Oh. So when Robert a bit ago was asking, what, how does it do that? How, how does it say to do this? The answer is, is it doesn't happen. <laughs> well, referring to all of them, yes. Kind of a general. Yeah. And when it's saying Israel, it's referring to. Not driving them out at once and had not handed them over to Joshua. Well, it's a, that's a, you're asking, so where like the center of. They're trying, they're trying to conquer right. land. They're trying to establish um, boundaries for, for tribal land, you know, but, you know, and like they, they, they probably have control over Jericho. They probably have control over I. They probably have a control over Shechem. But they also are like living peacefully with people that the text is like, don't, don't mingle with them. And they do. And so do they still have to yeah. Know. Yes. So no, because there are more books. So this is the books of Samuel and King. This is what these things get to. Um, and in fact, the argument or the belief is that the tabernacle is at Shiloh for like 300 years. If you were to go through the whole timeline. Um, the, the idea is that the tabernacle is at Shiloh longer than it was at anywhere else. Um, which is interesting, um, but again, that we're getting 
putting the cart before the horse. Um, okay, so Judges 2. So here we are at the next epistemological expansion, the knowledge of Hashem through mediation. But this time, it's through the mediation of judges. So the question is, is what are judges? And so now we can add another point of separation in our, epistemological, our epistemology chart. So we go from Moses in Deuteronomy to Joshua and Shechem. Right? Joshua and Shechem. From there, then we go from the prophets to judges. And we should note here that the ritual use of the dwelling place. So the, the blue is I'm trying it's trying to I'm trying to reflect the idea of the dwelling place as a containment of proximity to Hashem. Um, but we should know here that the ritual use of the dwelling place with the Le Levite priest is separated at this point in Judges. It is separated from the revelation of Hashem through the judges. So in other words, the dwelling place itself or the Ark of the Covenant itself takes the position of Hashem. There is a separation between the priests who perform ritual use of the dwelling place and the sacrifices and the judges who reveal the actions of Hashem to the people. So with the advent of the judges, the separation between ritual use of the tabernacle and mediation of prophecy is separated. Why? Because the revelation of Hashem were the commandments. So the purposes of the judges are to judge the people in their use of those commandments. And this is what the book of Judges is about. So basically, the, it's it's not prophecy of new commandments. Moses already did that. That revelation, there, there doesn't need to be new revelation about that. So basically, the rest of the book of Judges inscribes, it describes this dance back and forth where the people have no one to prophesy about what to do, and the people gravitate to idols in periods of time when there is a judge who has Hashem's spirit and can guide the people in their actions. And the whole book describes this dance back and forth, and we see judges like Othniel and Ehud and Shem, Shemgar and Deborah and Barak and Gideon and Samson. This is where we see the story of Samson and Delilah, um, who, by the way, Samson is the farthest cry from whatever Moses was that you could get. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, um, this is as far as I got tonight. Um, we will continue this onwards uh, next week. Um, and like I said, we're trying to get to Jerusalem. Um, and so the question is, and I'm, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit next week. Um, we're going to do a slight discussion on the Samaritan belief of why they went from Shechem to Shiloh. Because <clears throat> that's not in the text that most people um, would ascribe to or think of as the Bible or the Torah. But the Samaritans have a whole tradition about that. Um, and again, I find it interesting that the book of Joshua has no explanation. Um, so we'll talk about that and then we will we'll we'll skip judges and we will get to Samuel um, because the books of Samuel deal a lot with why they leave Shiloh. Um, and that is almost as equal of an importance of a of a theological issue as um, Mount Gerizim. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about next. Um, and then from there, we're going to be talking a bit about um, some quintessential ideas of what Judaism is. Um, and then my ultimate goal is to kind of like how these things I believe are a critical hermeneutic um, for what people call the New Testament. Um, and uh, and then we'll be done. So thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, so yeah, any questions?